This lecture will deal with the period of American history from 1865 to 1900. We already spoke of the growth of industry during the Civil War when demand for war material exploded. This was followed by a period in America where an industrial revolution occurred. With the growth of industry came the rise of labor and the development of unions to protect the rights of the workers. The period of industrialization saw the United States surpass Great Britain as the number one industrial nation in the world. A new prosperous middle class was established with the development of management layers in industry and new inventions like electric light, elevators and refrigeration improved living standards for many. Many, however, suffered under industrialization and this would lead, as I mentioned, to the rise of the labor movement. Just as England had conditions that were necessary for an industrial revolution to occur, so did the United States. Under the heading of land, we include natural resources and the United States had an abundance of the raw materials needed for industry, including coal, iron ore and oil. Alongside industrialization were inventions like electricity and steam pumps that could pump water out of deep mines and allow access to deeper seams of coal. With immigrants from southern and eastern Europe flooding into the country, especially the northeast urban centres, there was a plentiful supply of uneducated people to work menial factory jobs. Mechanisation and agriculture meant there was less need for labour on farms, so many people left rural areas and moved to the cities. Better food production on the farms could feel, feed more people in these cities. The process of population movement from country to city is called urbanisation. Lastly, there was plenty of money to fund the new factories and other means of production. A new business entity called a corporation was invented. It held all the rights of an individual and could be jointly owned by shareholders whose liability was limited to the ownership of the, co of the corporation. This reduced the risk in investment and encouraged more people to invest their money. As business grew, smart corporations did not take all the money out in profits, but invested also in research and development. This led to an even greater profits down the road. Today, companies like Apple reinvest a significant amount of their money in research and development. The government too encouraged new business and gave loans and financial aid called subsidies to them. But the driving force behind industrialization was the growth of railroads. Because of the Bessemer process, more steel could be produced and more railways built. Refrigerated cars allowed food to be transported over long distances. Pullman cars let people sleep on trains. Technological improvements of better coupling and stronger air brakes meant longer trains were in service that could pull more goods. They went faster and a standard sized track gauge meant people didn't have to change trains. Because of greater travel, time zones were created in 1883 and the first transcontinental railroad met up at Promontory Point in Utah in 1869, having been built by the Irish from the East Coast and the Chinese from the West Coast. Lastly, the government gave large amounts of land to railroad companies under the Pacific Railroad Act in 1862. This greatly aided the development of railroads in the western part of the country, though it did lead to a lot of graft and corruption. So with the expansion of markets through the expansion of railroads, demand was much greater, which created the need for greater supply. Assembly lines and factories became the means of production for the mass market. The leading entrepreneurs who capitalized on this new economic model were Andrew Carnegie in steel, John D. Rockefeller in oil, Philip Armour in meatpacking, and J.P. Morgan in finance. An entrepreneur is someone who is successful in setting up a business. A great National Geographic series called The Men Who Built America is worth watching. It is a dramatization of these men and their power. 
in developing their companies to dominate the market, they devise plans of vertical and horizontal integration. For example, in the Standard Oil Company, Rockefeller controlled all the areas of production. He owned the oil wells, he owned the refineries where oil was refined, he owned the transport that transported the oil, he owned the storage tankers where the gas was kept, and he owned the gas stations where the gas was sold to consumers. On top of this, Rockefeller introduced horizontal integration, where he controlled completely one area of the process. For example, in Ohio, he owned 37 out of the 40 refineries. By combining horizontal and vertical integration, Rockefeller created a monopoly in his business field. This reduced competition and made him vast amounts of money. By combining vertical and horizontal integration, Rockefeller monopolized the oil industry in Ohio. To further protect and consolidate his gains, he created trusts, which were giant companies made up of smaller companies. The Standard Oil Trust was made up of 40 companies. In 1892, the Ohio Supreme Court ruled that the Standard Oil Trust was illegal because it was a monopoly and curtailed competition. To get around the laws, Rockefeller created a holding company where stocks were held by a company that supposedly didn't own them. Pools divided up the state into areas where companies wouldn't compete with each other. And interlocking directorates were directors of one company who served on the board of others. So basically these directors knew what was going on in each other's company and made sure the companies did not compete against each other, only against outside companies. Because of these illegal practices and the ruthless nature of their business and the contempt they had for the small businessmen, not to mention the large profits they made, these businessmen became known as the robber barons. They interpreted the Enlightenment not only as personal liberty, but as economic liberty. In Charles Darwin's The Origin of the Species, a basic principle was that only the strongest species survive. These entrepreneurs applied that to business, a survival of the fittest, and it was a principle that became known as social Darwinism. On the other hand, Andrew Carnegie, with his millions made, gave back to charity. He created endowments and other charities, and the financial and source, sources for these came from him. In 1900, he sold his business to J.P. Morgan, for, in today's money, $310 billion. This was the beginning of finance capitalism, where financial institutions took control of businesses, started by entrepreneurs. Today, we see the same thing with many hedge funds taking control of businesses. The unfair practices of big business were first challenged by the farmers. They were getting very charged getting charged very high rates during harvest season. The grain elevator owners knew that they had to pay them their asking price or their crops would rot. The farmers lobbied their state representatives who passed a law capping the rates the elevator operators could charge. Big business sued and the case went to the Supreme Court of the United States in Munn versus Illinois in 1877. The grain op operators argued that because corporations were considered a person, their rights were being violated as protected in the 14th Amendment. Also, only the federal government could regulate interstate commerce, so the law was illegal. However, the Supreme Court ruled against big business and the grain elevators in favour of the farmers, saying that because the public interest was at stake, the state could regulate private property. And that secondly, because the elevators were in one state, it was not interstate commerce. However, in subsequent cases, Wabash St. Louis and Pacific Railroad versus Illinois, Santa Clara County and Southern Pacific Railroad, both in 1886, the Supreme Court ruled that big business was protected under the 14th Amendment. The password today is trust. I repeat, the password today is trust. At this time, the federal government stepped in to regulate big business. 
the Interstate Commerce Act was passed in 1887 and the Interstate Commerce Commission was set up to regulate it. However, the Supreme Court of the United States was firmly behind big business and ruled against the Interstate Commerce Commission 15 out of 16 times. The Sherman Antitrust Act was ineffective too and United States versus E.C. Knight, the Supreme Court found that a combination of sugar refineries that controlled 98% of the nation's sugar refining business was not a violation because they were not involved in trade and business. It was indeed a victory for laissez-faire forces. In response to the new working conditions brought about by industrialization, a labor movement evolved. A huge new pool of workers existed to create this movement. People moved from rural areas to urban areas where it was easier to form unions because people worked in closer proximity to one another in factories. Mechanization on farms meant there was less work to be had. And from 1870-1910, the number of farmers dropped by 16%. Immigration played the biggest role in the growth of the labor force. 13 million new immigrants, mainly from Southern and Eastern Europe, flooded into the cities of Northeast America. They were mainly unskilled and so were perfectly suited to factory work. Women entered the workforce as new inventions like the typewriter and as in, were invented and as industry expanded, the growing need for more office workers led to their employment. Companies could pay women less and thus increase profits. During the period of industrialization, 1.75 million children under the age of 15 joined the workforce. Once again, children could be paid less, so this increased profits too. The government did introduce legislation forbidding child labor or, redu or reducing it, but it was rarely enforced. While the standard of living did improve and the population of the United States did live better, it was the poor working conditions that prompted workers to organize. Assembly lines and factories reduced workers to the same repetitive tasks all day long. Contact with others was disallowed and the noise of the machinery drowned all else out. This led to low morale and feelings of despair. While workers did make money, real wages rarely increased and did not keep up with inflation. Often workers had to spend money in company shops and in other more isolated factories, workers lived in company towns, paying high rent to management. Underemployment or not having enough work was another problem. Companies followed the boom and bust cycle, hiring lots of workers when demand was high and then laying them off. Busts happened in 1873, 1882 and 1893. Workers often worked 15 hours a day, six days a week with a half hour for lunch. Often it was piecemeal work. You got paid for the amount of work completed. It was similar to the sweatshops of today. Managers walked the floor to make sure no one was slacking. There were few, if any, safety controls. Today, emergency stop buttons or protective bars exist. Limbs and lives were lost and there was no workers' compensation to pay you if you couldn't work. Working in coal mines was particularly dangerous, especially for children. All these factors led to the rise of the labor movement. The workers formed trade unions, which were organizations of skilled workers in one line of work. The National Labor Union, the Knights of Labor, and the American Federation of Labor all were created, the AFL being the most successful because it focused on bread and butter issues. Their aims were based on the poor working conditions we just listed, an eight hour day, an end to child labor, safety inspections to reduce the danger in factories and cooperatives where employees could share in the profits of the company. The methods of the unions were mainly peaceful. Arbitration is where both sides to agree to accept the ruling of a third party. They have this in baseball today. 
Collective bargaining is where management and labour sit down together and hammer out a deal. If management refused to work with the union, other, un other methods were employed, like a slowdown where workers deliberately worked slower. The last resort was a strike where workers walked off the job. Management with massive profits at stake did not take the rise of labour movement lying down. They employed various methods to beat the unions. A blacklist was a list of workers who supported the labour movement and were known for organising unions. Owners would circulate this list, warning each other not to hire these workers. A yellow dog contract was an agreement workers had to sign before they took a job, saying they would not join a union. If they did, they would be fired. Welfare capitalism was used by management. They gave the workers some benefits and allowed them to have a company union, which would not give them the same concessions as an outside union, but nevertheless made workers more reluctant to join outside unions. Troublesome workers or organisers were promoted to management positions and with better pay, they used their communication skills to fight the unions they had worked for. Spies reported on organisers who were subsequently fired. Lockouts occurred when workers went on strike. The owners locked the doors to the strikers and got other workers to do the work. The unions called these strike breakers scabs. Management often went to court where they sought injunctions to stop workers going on strike. Injunctions are court orders preventing something happening. Lastly, and it was this violence that hurt the labour movement most. Owners would send strike breakers to fight or intimidate workers. They would particularly target the leaders of the strike and in some extreme cases end up killing them. All in all, the labour movement was unsuccessful at this time. There were numerous reasons for this. Many workers, because of their low wages, couldn't afford the necessary membership fees or dues of the union, so they couldn't join. The fear of getting fired was enough for lots of workers to not get involved. Because the immigrants represented different ethnic groups, management played upon their diversity and kept them divided. This made it difficult for them to organise. Skilled workers, of whom there were some, did not want to be involved with unskilled workers. And in America, there was less sense of class consciousness than existed in Europe. America was the land of opportunity where everyone supposedly had an equal opportunity to make a bid. America too was founded upon a belief in capitalism and a free market economy. Trade unions focused on equality and the government helping workers. This move away from laissez-faire to socialism was seen by many as a threat to the political ideology on which America was founded. But it was the violence that created the most lasting damage to the labour union. Four major clashes between the labour movement and management took place. The railroad strike of 1877 was not well organised and when violence broke out, the unions got bad press. The Haymarket riot in Chicago in 1886 saw bombs thrown and people shot. Anarchists, or those who believe there should be no government rules in society, were blamed, and the fear that the labour movement was radicalised lost it a lot of support among the general public. It was the Haymarket riot that would do the most and lasting damage to the labour movement in America. In both the Homestead Steel Strike and the Pullman Strike, the government backed big business in the Steel Strike actually sending the National Guard in. And as in the court rulings at the time, the labour movement was on the losing side. Please complete the following questions in the relevant place in your um, Google worksheet. I will give you some time for each question. If you need more time, please pause the video. Thank you.
This concludes our lecture for today. Thank you for your time and thank you for your time.